time on Landmarks, we visit one of Paris's great culinary destinations. Then we work off the pounds at the Brandenburg Gate. Spy the future in Brazil and look in on the construction of a new landmark. But first... The Sydney Harbour Bridge is Australia's best-known landmark. It is the biggest, but not the longest, steel arch bridge in the world. At its highest point, the arch reaches 134 metres over sea level. A masterpiece of 1920s construction, it rivals the great New York skyscrapers of the same period. Some people think of the bridge as Australia's Statue of Liberty. It has been a symbol of welcome for millions of visitors and migrants. In the bridge's first year of operation in 1932, an average of 10,000 cars were crossing. By 2001, despite an underground tunnel taking much of the traffic flow, the figure had grown to 160,000 a day. Besides its iconic status, the coat hanger, as the Australians nicknamed their bridge, is a practical link from one side of the city to the other for cars, trains and pedestrians. And sometimes it's a sight for spectacular celebration. Australian Formula One driver Mark Webber was given the chance to act out every Sydney commuter's dream. The Sydney Harbour Bridge to himself, without tolls, red lights or even a speed limit. Webber was given the equivalent of the keys to the city for this stunt, with all traffic on the bridge blocked off for a couple of hours. Usually, traffic runs over the nearly 50 metre wide deck in eight lanes, alongside two railway lines, a walkway and a bicycle path. At 8.10am on a Sunday morning, the Australians set off and crossed the bridge a dozen times, while spectators followed the stunt on a huge video screen. Well, it's pretty amazing, obviously. Uh, this is the most famous landmark in Australia. Uh, the Sydney Harbour Bridge is uh, very, very famous, and uh, for them to shut the bridge to run a Formula One car over it is uh, something that's very special. And uh, to be involved in that, obviously, uh, is a dream for me. Sydney is Australia's business heart, but it is also a cosmopolitan city, which attracts visitors from around the world. With a great climate, it likes to let its hair down on a regular basis, and the 2000 Olympics was one such opportunity the city went into an extended party mode. With the Olympic rings emblazoned across it, the Harbour Bridge was, as always, a centrepiece. Despite appearing weightless, the arch alone weighs 39,000 tonnes and spans over 500 metres. Each new year in Sydney, starts with a spectacular fireworks display off the bridge. The beginning of 2007 was especially vibrant. It was the start of the icon's 75th anniversary year. Police estimate a million people crammed the foreshore for the fireworks and day-long festivities, some staking their claims to the best vantage points before dawn and pitching tents in case of rain. With its fellow icon, the Sydney Opera House nearby, you can see why it was worth the effort for those with a good viewing spot. The fireworks are always spectacular. At 75 years old, the bridge remains in remarkably good condition, in part due to its rigorous maintenance regime. Its steel structure needs continuous protection from the salty air and is continuously being painted. Each pass requires the equivalent of 60 sports fields of paint. 
At that rate, the Sydney Harbour Bridge will maintain its good looks for many years to come. Coming up, the blue train. The Paris Universal Exposition of 1889 had at its centrepiece Gustave Eiffel's Thousand Foot Tower, then the tallest structure ever made by man. It reminded the world that the French capital was enjoying a golden age, a time that is often referred to as the Belle Epoque or the Beautiful Era. Gare de Lyon railway station housed one of the many elegant restaurants patronised by Parisian society. The Train Bleu, or the Blue Train, overlooks the departure platform for trains travelling to the south of France. But why the Blue Train? The Blue Train, simply because it was the train going to the Riviera. It was the colour people saw when they woke up in the train in the morning and opened the windows. Everything was blue and it was fantastic. After a long and detailed renovation, the Blue Train restaurant has been restored to its original grandeur. And how better to celebrate its centenary than with a special dinner for which the guests dressed in period costume to relive a golden age of affluence and artistic creativity. But while the spectacular interior of the restaurant can evoke memories of yesteryear, it's quite a different story behind the scenes. Feverish activity in the kitchen pays homage to the very best of modern French cuisine. Chef André Signoret feels it is a privilege to be working in such a significant environment. But at the same time, he welcomes the challenge of introducing 21st century gastronomy to the historic restaurant. The Blue Train has been in existence for one century. It has changed since then, of course. We prepare a more modern cuisine. It is a restaurant which is wonderful thanks to its décor, its regular clients. It is very lively and we serve about 500 people per day. The restaurant was officially declared of historical interest in 1972 and restoration began soon after. Some 30 painters carried out the decoration of the restaurant, with the wall murals depicting scenes from the south of France, the region serviced by the original blue train. For the ceilings, the architect called in artists who had already decorated part of the Sorbonne ceilings, the Paris Town Hall and the Comic Opera. For those who could recall the glory days of the blue train, this was a special night. This evening is very important for me. I got to know the blue train in the 50s when it was not what it is today. The rooms were abandoned. It has been redone beautifully, cleaned up, and I have watched it become a restaurant again. It brings to life the period around 1900, and I have a lot of affection and tenderness for that time. I love the style of those years, the clothes for men and women. It was superb. Magnificent. Turn of the century Paris was a city of writers, artists and musicians, the cosmopolitan capital of pleasure and culture. And more than a century later, this evening reproduced that lifestyle in every detail. <laughs> the centenary celebration ended with the entrance of a spectacular birthday cake covered with candles and lit up with fireworks. A fitting tribute to an era that took Paris to the forefront of chic European society. There are some people who just want to climb things. This is one such man, Stefan Minton, a German who claims to be the world's only professional stair climber. This task, running up the 26-metre Brandenburg Gate in Berlin, seems an almost ridiculous challenge compared to some of his other achievements. But to many Germans, 
such a run remains a powerful symbolic act. With the restored Quadriga of Victory looking on, the austere gate remains Germany's most potent icon. The line of demarcation in the Cold War lies in Berlin. West Berlin, with its burgeoning prosperity, is a thorn in the side of... From 1961 to 1989, such a simple act would have been impossible. ...desperation threw up their wall of hate to seal off the border. In a bitter political struggle between the communist East Germans and the capitalist West, a concrete wall was erected to stop passage between the two. The Brandenburg Gate stood in no man's land, the neutral zone between the two Berlins. Since its construction in 1791, the gate has been both a symbol of unity and division. Many a military procession of Adolf Hitler's Nazis passed through its columns in the 1930s. In the early 60s, there were many desperate scenes. At the time of its construction in the late 18th century, it was just one of 18 gates enclosing the cosmopolitan city. It is the sole surviving gate. Stefan Minton was nearing completion of his own personal victory. With the four horses of the Quadriga of Victory statue now alongside, Stefan could reflect on his efforts. The 37-year-old, whose entire life consists of running up exotic places around the world, has also climbed Kuala Lumpur's TV tower in Malaysia's capital. I put Brandenburg Gate into a sort of ranking list, my personal list, which includes Big Ben, the Eiffel Tower, the Empire State Building in New York, the Great Wall and the Pyramids in Cairo. Those are what I consider to be the highlights, which one should see at least once. Like any good sportsperson, Stefan worked his way up. My first staircase run was in 2000 in New York. Then I participated at the Malaysian Staircase Run World Championships and during the running free time I did several projects like the first climb of Europe's highest office building and highest hotel and the world's tallest church. There was now a chance to take in the view. It was difficult not to reflect on what the view would have been in times past. Berlin is now a unified modern city. With the demise of the Berlin Wall in 1989, the Brandenburg Gate finally became a symbol of unity. Soon afterwards, the Berlin landmark had damage dating back to World War II repaired and its sandstone exterior cleaned. West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl walked through to be greeted by Hans Modrow, the East German Prime Minister, and proclaimed, this must be a gate of peace. A sudden rifle shot won't end their dreams, and a slip won't bring disaster. Freedom is man's most prized possession, and it is only for those who love it. Coming up, going around in Brazil. Have you ever thought about being able to change the view from the window of your home? If so, a new rotating building recently built in Brazil might be for you, if you have the asking price of several hundred thousand US dollars. In the city of Curitiba in southern Brazil, they like to do things differently. What makes the 11-storey Suite Vollard unique is that each floor can rotate 360 degrees independently of the others. Would you like the sun on your feet as you wake up in the morning? Would you like a view of the city skyline glistening in the dusk as you sit down for a romantic dinner. Then program your floor to rotate accordingly. 
And if you want the opposite tomorrow, then simply change the settings. But who wants to buy a rotating apartment? Eccentric people, celebrities, people with a different lifestyle. Those are the people who would probably own a Lamborghini or a Ferrari. Pele, for example, is one of our biggest promoters. We also have artists. So those are the people that are uncommon people. Now what we are trying to do is adapt our product to their lifestyles. The core of the building does not rotate. This is where the kitchen and bathroom are located. But every other space in the apartment spins around. The building's architect, Bruno De Franco, says he designed Sweet Vollard as homage to the artist Pablo Picasso. The inspiration for the rotation of this building came from the great work of Picasso. We wanted to pay homage to him with a work that was up to his standards. Years ago, it would have been impossible to build something like this. DeFranco adds that the design was not complicated. The idea is to be able to change the view from your apartment to suit your whim, not to be on a fairground ride. The technology that we use here is in fact very simple. In this building, for instance, we have this rotating capsule which is on top of a dented round platform. And we have a big chain and a motor and engine. This is more or less the principle of this building. The building is another addition to the reputation of a city becoming known for its innovation. And the company who built it has now decided to take their rotating building to the world. We're aiming at the, um, the high-end markets in America and in Europe, in Asia, and that means being um, where luxury condos can be sold, okay? Because we want to bring all technology available in the world to, to these investors and to these uh, families that would like to have, to have everything at their disposal. The company had originally planned to sell the apartments, but when they realised what an original building they had, they decided to use it as a prototype. They are now hard at work on designs for newer and bigger rotating buildings. Kurichiba sits on a plane high above sea level, but very close to the Atlantic Ocean. While the city faces many of the same problems as others in the developing world, residents pride themselves on a clean and orderly city. They were one of the first in Latin America to introduce a city-wide recycling program, and they are now home to a whole new concept in architecture. One of the reasons this awesome undertaking in Spain is a landmark is the fact that it exists in spite of the attitude of many in its surrounding community. They treat it as meaningless. Not that that worries the man behind the project. Justo Galigo has been building what he calls a cathedral, single-handedly, for the last 40 years. This is no traditional cathedral. And Justo is neither a qualified architect, nor engineer, nor bricklayer. He's a farmer. Nor does he have formal planning permission from the authorities of Mayorada del Campo, the town in which it is located, 20 kilometers from Madrid. The plans have only ever existed in my head, he says, and they have evolved over time in response to opportunity and inspiration. I was inspired by many things. I was inspired by my mother who taught me to love the church. I was inspired by Christ. Being sons of light, we have to love Christ with devotion, and I followed that principle. That's how I began this project. At this stage, the cathedral reaches to a height of 35 metres at its highest point. But when finished, it will soar to 55 metres. The building sits on an 8,000 square metre plot of land 
and, but for a bishop, has all the trappings of a cathedral. Cloisters, a sacristy, parish meeting rooms, a baptism chapel, a library, and an arch-lined gallery that looks down on the unfinished nave. With its columns, arches and dome, Galigo describes the building, for which no blueprints or sketches have ever been made, as Greco-Romanesque. The construction has been undertaken with no official funding. <laughs> Most of the materials used are recycled, occasionally obtained from business and construction companies with excess materials for a job. Progress is therefore visibly marked by the nature and quality of what Galigo has been able to acquire along the way. The builder wants his windows filled with stained glass, but is looking to do it on the cheap, using two tons of glass donated by some German tourists. This most unorthodox of churches attracts coachloads of tourists. But as much as the building draws the admiration of those watching, so too does the spirit of Don Justo, who shows no signs of tiredness as he continues to pursue his passion. No, no, no. Tiredness? No. As a Christian, I can't do that. I do get tired, but I remember that Christ says that those who put the tools aside and walk away don't have rights to heaven. I work with passion. Don Justo Galigo may be a man before his time. Huddled in two old coats by a bonfire in the nave, his face grubby and his cheeks hollow, the 80-year-old former monk is sometimes compared to Catalan architect Antoni Gaudi, the creator of Barcelona's unfinished Sagrada Familia church, in part because in Gaudi's final days he was mistaken for a tramp. The comparison is helped by the church's address, number 10 Antoni Gaudi Street. Galigo is realistic about the future. I am already very happy. If I can do more, I'll be happier. But with what I have already done, it's enough. We are going to try to finish it, but that is going to be too much for me. It will cost a lot of money that I don't have. Questions have been raised concerning its foundations and bracings, and nobody wants to be responsible for its structural integrity. Given the lack of official support and the value of the land on which it is located, Don Justo is aware that the cathedral may be raised immediately after his death.